to thank you as well, Claire, yeah. for coming today. Um, I told her out there that I was counting down the days for this event. It's, it's really true. It was in my calendar since December, and I've just been so excited um, because this book, uh, it really changed my life as a founder, even though there's just two of us at the company right now. Um, and a lot of what's written about is you know, for later stages, but so many things that um, I read have just been so impactful for me um, and for my co-founder to think about um, just when there's two of us in, in the company. And so um, I'll do a quick book promotion for everybody, and then, then we'll turn it over. But um, you know, so many of the books that I've read about management and startup building have been very like hand wavy. Like they say things like hire slow and fire fast, and it's like okay, well I agree with that I guess, but how do I actually do it? What like what do I actually need to to do to hire slow and fire fast? What do I need to look out for, uh, and so on and so forth. But scaling people is not at all written in that way very tactical. It gives so many concrete examples of, of, of lessons from your experiences um, so that founders and managers can really take the book, flip to it at any time that they need advice, uh, and pull something out and, and just you know, get that advice kind of on the spot. So 
this has been such a helpful book uh, for me, and Thank I you. can't recommend it enough for everyone in the audience. So before we dive into the book, though, um, I think it might be helpful if you talk about your career journey. A lot of us are just getting started out, um, and it's helpful to hear about um, you know, the path that you took and when you had to make transitions, how did you know that you needed to make those, uh, and how did you ultimately understand that management and operations was mm. something that you wanted to do? I'll try to do the shorter version of this, but <laughs> thank you uh, to Sheila and everyone at the Nelson Center for hosting me and Dana a great for agreeing. I didn't realize I was going to have a founder as my moderator, which <laughs> really made my day when I figured that out finally. Because um, that's kind of what I do uh, still today is work very closely with founders of companies of all stages, uh, but mostly uh, sort of early to growth stage companies. Stripe has gone beyond that, but insists on staying private, <laughs> so we, we try to keep it secretive as to where we are. Um, I, um, and I went to Brown, uh, which I'll talk about in my career journey. Uh, and uh, that was uh, important, but there was no Center for Entrepreneurship at Brown at that point. So it's exciting to see uh, how the school has evolved uh, in the time I've spent back here. Uh, my career journey was pretty random, so I'm just going to own that. And I think in retrospect, you can usually tell a narrative about your career. But while you're in it, it's actually not that easy to figure out what's going on. And, and the main thing is just to keep going. Uh, so I'll give you that advice. I um, was a child of two teachers, a college professor and an English teacher. And that's relevant because I did not have a lot of exposure to business in my home. Or if anything, my parents were anti-capitalism, um, which is you know, fine. But, uh, and I have some of that streak in me. I tend to gravitate toward more mission-driven enterprises, uh, though they tend to be capitalistic, I'll admit it, but uh, I'm not going to work somewhere that I don't believe uh, in the people and the product uh, as a force for good. Uh, and I've had choices in my career where I've decided not to do that. Um, anyway, my parents were teachers. I uh, grew up as the child of a faculty member at a private school. I ended up at Brown. Uh, Luckily, I don't think I would get in today, <laughs> uh, but I did. And I was very much a humanities kid, uh, much more into history and English, and kind of afraid of STEM, uh, which came back to bite me in the ass in business school. So appreciate having no requirements, but remember, there are skills to be built, and I just had to build them later uh, because I sort of avoided it. But I love that about Brown. I really took what I was interested in, and I got very interested in politics, actually, political science and public policy, which does have a, a very stats-heavy element to it, so that was good. But um, And then coming out of Brown, unlike a lot of my, so my version of entrepreneurship was, I'm not going to go work at like a consulting firm or a banking firm, which was kind of the hotness then. You all will experience this. There's like different things that are the hotness, depending on what sort of five-year period you're in, maybe 10-year period. And I was like, I'm going to go work on a political campaign. <coughs> Uh, which is not a thing you can really get going while you're still at school. So I kind of graduated and had a little bit of a crisis, I'll be honest. I moved back in with my parents, and I was like, what the hell am I doing? But I, I sort of persisted through networking and got a job on a political campaign for a candidate uh, for governor in Massachusetts who was definitely going to lose. Like, it was easy to get a job. They were going to pay me, like, nothing, basically. <laughs> and he was going to lose, so no one else wanted to work there. But it was a good experience. <laughs> uh, it was a good experience. Uh, I'm not going to go through every step, but I then iterated through the next few years between uh, political campaigns, and I had taken the LSAT while I was at Brown because I thought I was going to go to law school because, again, the whole politics thing was like very hot for me. I was like, I'm going to somehow probably run for office. That was my, or I really wanted to be on the Supreme Court which it turns out you can't really plan. But those were my <laughs> two plans. Uh, so I was sort of political campaign, and then I did a stint in New York at a magazine political campaign. I worked at it for a foundation on a project, a grant project uh, that was a gun control project, whatever. I did it some random stuff, folks. Uh, I, you know, I was like briefly a, a writer. Uh, and then I ended up uh, getting into law school uh, three years in a row and not going. Uh, you can't defer law school, at least you couldn't back in my, my day. I'm going to say those words. And uh, the last time I got in, I got into Harvard, which is probably where I should have wanted to go if I was going to be in the Supreme Court, that or Yale, right? And I um, realized there must be a reason I'm not going. 
Uh, I had just not listened to myself enough. I had just been sort of running and running and doing the thing uh, that was expected. And I sort of gut checked and at the last second applied to business school. Uh, and I went to Yale School of Management, which has a reputation for uh, accepting about, at least then, about a third of the class came from non-traditional backgrounds, which I definitely qualified for. And uh, that was me realizing, I think I actually want to do this business thing, whatever this thing is. And, I, and through the campaigns, I'd worked with a lot of really interesting, impactful business leaders, company founders and leaders, mostly CEO types. Uh, who were advising the campaign, had policy positions, and also were very influential in what laws were getting uh, passed, which I realized. I was like, huh, this is where impact is. It's in business. And if you study the history of this country, impact in the 1960s was in the law. But I kind of got the picture of like, mm, the impact is actually going to be in people who build companies. Economic engines, economic growth. If you followed the Bill Clinton campaign at all, it's the economy, stupid, is real. And that's what matters. And I think people's income and access to income matters. And that has been a narrative of my career, but it took me a while to figure it out. Business school, I then went to work for kind of a startup consulting firm. It's a good experience. I was consulting to mostly media companies, AKA New York Times, Dow Jones, DirecTV. They were getting disrupted by this thing called the internet. That's, yes, when I was at Brown, we, I, I did have a personal computer, but we did not have access to the internet in our dorms. I just want you to all understand that. Uh, anyway, uh, the internet was disrupting these companies. And what was really interesting as a consultant is you get to come in and you're in like the boardroom and they just do not have any idea. And they're really smart people and they have a great business and you're like, yeah, but this thing is happening to you. And they're like, da, 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 you know, and it was, I was like, geez, this is not good. Like. So, I got to go work in the internet because these companies are not the companies I should be working for. Uh, so I quit that job, finished a project, uh, moved with no job, and this is another theme of my career. I was, un it was uncomfortable to do this, but I graduated from Brown with no job, and I left my consulting job and had no job when I moved to California. And I wouldn't say I came from a lot of means, so certainly people in positions with a lot of resources can do that. That was not exactly my situation, but I wasn't in terrible shape. But I did have to really plan being able to be unemployed, but I was unafraid to do it. Uh, and I think that actually ended up being very important in some moments where I wasn't going to just take anything. I was going to find something interesting to me. Uh, so moved to California right after the dot-com bust. Everyone I knew was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I still believe there's something out there. Uh, and I had had friends in San Francisco. My then boyfriend and now husband also had so actually some family and friends in San Francisco. We drove across the country jobless, and we both ended up working at Google. Um, and that was a good choice. Uh, Google was, I, I actually got hired first, pre-IPO. He started <laughs> after, I'm just going to say. He took a different job that wasn't so great. Uh, but it was fine. Uh, in the security company, which was fine. But we basically got into tech, uh, and at Google, and I got into Google through a business school friend of mine who, and this happens, you all have network. You all have network from be going to Brown. But one of my best friends from business school went to Harvard with Cheryl Sandberg. And Cheryl hired a few of her friends from Harvard. And I ended up sort of networking in, doing info interviews with the friend group of Sheryl Sandberg, <laughs> and then getting hired as a manager in her organization. And then commenced an 11, this is probably too long, but yeah, I think it's relevant to the state. Uh, then commenced an almost 11 year career at Google that I would bucket into three buckets. Number one was very operations, meaning sort of support and, and really country, opening new countries and markets and expanding products and logistics, working a lot with engineering and product, but really more on the operations side. Then I was a revenue leader for Cheryl. I ran the mid-market for, well, for Google, which was like about two, eventually 2,000 people in sort of 16 countries, but global team. Um, Cheryl left for Facebook, and I basically inherited half, a little bit more than half of her job through a series of a lot of things. But then I had revenue leader period, which is pretty important for my career, uh, which is I, I had an $11 billion quota. Uh, now, I'm not going to like pretend I actually could meet an $11 billion quota. If any of you have done any sales, you know that sounds like unrealistic. Because uh, Google's search results 
and what color of the pixels behind the ad are is what probably delivered 10 point six or seven <laughs> billion of my quota, but the last few hundred million I really had to work for uh, <laughs> with my team. My team did the work. Uh, anyway, so that was like in 2010. And then I had sort of a producty GM period of Google where I ended up uh, leading a product and engineering team that was a kind of a business unit experiment that Google did. Honestly, a, a failing product, which is why I probably got the chance to lead it. But to actually lead engineering was unusual for someone who did not have an engineering background. I had sort of self-taught myself enough that I was credible enough, but I had a very strong engineering partner who still is a partner of mine. He works at Stripe now. I hired him into Stripe. Uh, and, then, um, and then this GM sort of, I helped run the self-driving cars project. So at the very end of my time at Google, I was sort of getting the inkling I should be leaving. And I'd said, I'd almost taken a couple of roles as a COO at growth stage companies. Uh, and I decided to do a COO kind of job for an early stage company, which was self-driving cars. And that was only a couple hundred people. It was like the, si the size that Stripe was sort of when I joined, like 170 people. Still kind of r and I mean, very much still R&D phase. Let's not kid ourselves. But we were doing conversations. I was sort of in charge of talking to the, the big car companies, doing BD, doing, I did have product and industrial design under me. I helped design a vehicle, which today, if you'd asked me when I was a Brown undergraduate, would I be helping to lead a team that designed a vehicle? I would have said, no, that is insane, and you never know what's gonna happen. Anyway, uh, we designed this low-speed vehicle called Firefly that was really cute, that was like a proof of concept for the product, which is, could self-drive. Uh, and then I went to, and then I joined Stripe. Stripe um, was, yeah, as Sheila said, I was about 160 people uh, and definitely had product market fit, definitely on a trajectory. Uh, in fact, if anything, underbuilt for where it should have been when I joined, which turned into my job for the next couple of years to get ourselves out of the ditch into the size we should be for the business that we were building. Um, so yeah, a lot of random, and now today I work part-time at Stripe. I still work closely with the founders when they need me, and I do some internal stuff. Uh, I'm on some boards. I do some investing, uh, and this book ended up, thank you for the nice things you said about it. The founders of Stripe made me write it, and they're, uh, I really, I mean, I did eventually write it, but it was their idea, and it was because as founders, they were, they're very autodidacts, like, I mean, insanely self-taught in many, many disciplines, but they've both kind of read everything there is on company building and management, um, and had before I even met them, but they didn't feel the market had a tactical enough guide, uh, and like really tactical <laughs> and practical and like examples, because a lot of founders are like, yeah, you can describe the thing, but tell me how to do the thing. And so scaling people turned into my pandemic project uh, and then as my role transitioned at Stripe became a bigger part of my time. And then uh, the book has had a reception that has been surprisingly strong to me um, and has turned into uh, some opportunities to keep working with, yeah, founders and companies. What's interesting is some more uh, mature companies are interested in talking about scaling people. Uh, I think because it has some more modern notions of management in it, which I guess is my philosophy. Uh, and we can talk about that if we want. But I've found that I have to say no to things like MetLife wanting me to come to their company conference. <laughs> I'm like, really? Uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's been fascinating. And the questions I get are, are exciting to me. So that's the story. <laughs> and I majored in English. <laughs> and I can read a lot and write really quickly. Thank goodness, because there's a lot of information flow in startups. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, and so now we're going to dive into the book. So the first question that I have, um, in the first few pages, you mentioned giving a talk at a 40-person startup. Yes. And someone asked what uh, processes you recommend they put in place. And you said something like, I'm not going to tell you which processes you should put in place. But I will tell you that you need them, and you need them sooner than you realize. So why are these explicit structures and processes so important, even in the really early stages? Yeah, I mean, basically the premise of the book is early on in a company, you're really just trying to get product market fit, any sign of traction, and you're just trying to survive. And I wouldn't recommend spending too much time on the structures for the company. 
And in fact, the thing that's hard about being a founder, and some of you, it sounds like, are experiencing this, is you have to be obsessed with product building, whatever that product is, and that's really all of your time and energy and bandwidth. And then the minute you start to, like, sometimes there's false traction, but let's assume you've got real traction, meaning people are using the product, ideally paying for it, in my opinion, and um, it's starting to, to grow in a predictable fashion. Maybe that's just month over month, but ideally year over year. All of a sudden, you have to sort of not stop your product building work, but overnight transform into a company builder, which is actually not the same skill set. There are some of the same principles apply, but it's really not the same skill set. And um, that is rough because most of your life, you've not thought about that stuff. And why would you? You've been obsessed with some product you want to build, right? And so, I, I, and that is where thinking about a team, thinking about who do I have around the table, who's on my board, who are my advisors, who are people who do this company building stuff? Because if you looked at my career, I did some product work, which is like, I think if there's anything that I've developed is a skill set as a translation engine <laughs> uh, between product and engineering and, and the language and the work and the requirements of that and company building and business building, by the way. Like you can't build a company without a business. Uh, and I think that that, um, that marriage becomes very important to you at a stage of company. Uh, but what I was describing to this 40-person startup, which I can tell you all, is a company called Coda, uh, which you may have heard of. It's sort of in the Notion space. Um, and Coda uh, was about 40 people at the time. And the analogy I use, which uh, thank you, Dana, for not stealing my thunder that's in the book, I think is appropriate, which is once you get past, like we could all have like a, a meeting in this room and you could all hear stuff and we could make some decisions, but we're kind of at the max. Like it would be hard for me to get each of you to participate. Like if I wanted to have each of you say something in your opinion about a decision, we'd be in a meeting all, most of the day. Is everyone with me? This is about the stage where you're like, crap, I gotta put some structures in place. Because not all these people can have a super productive group discussion decision in like an hour, and we need to sort of divide and conquer, right? And, it's, and everyone's nodding, you're like, that makes sense. Like, right, that makes sense. But actually, that can be really fraught. You're like, well, who gets to stay? Or which decisions? Or who's working on what? Or what happens if you decide something and we don't know about it, right? And then the founder gets super agitated because they're like, well, what if those people decide things that I didn't want them to do it that way? Because that's scary. Uh, right, like, so it's, it's actually really tough to go from this moment that we're in. I, I call it 40 to 50, but it could be 20. Depends on your company. I mean, look at WhatsApp. It was like, you know, 60 people when it got bought for 19 billion, whatever. Anyway, so, so I think that the, um, the analogy I use is, is sports, which is funny because I'm not like a huge athlete, but I, I think sports is a really good place to look for lessons of management, leadership, team building. Uh, but in this case, what, why are sports fun? They're fun because you know the rules. You know the size of, let's say, the field. You know what it scoring is. You know generally what's against the rules. Like, you know what equipment you're allowed to use and not use. And you have positions that you play. So you understand your objectives, you understand your positions. What if instead I gave everybody in this room different pieces of sports equipment, sent you out onto the green, and said win. A lot of companies do that. Uh, mostly the different pieces of sports equipment is that you got hired and you're told you roughly have a job, but it's not super well defined. And so you're like running onto the green ready to do something, let's say in sales. Uh, but you have very little guidance about what that, who do I sell to? What is, what is the way we sell? Do I have a tool where I track my selling? And what is, like, do we have a goal for this month, this week, this quarter, right? Like, all of this seems super obvious. Like, that's the other thing I would say. Management books, like, it's easy to state the obvious. It's like not easy to do it. But I cannot say enough. And so what I said to Coda, I would say to all of you, which is, does it matter what type of goal framework you use? Does it matter exactly how you define every role? Does it matter, like, what time frame? Stripe, for a long time, we planned on six months, not quarter time frames. It's a, I can explain why, but we just... In a weird way, it was because things were changing so quickly that we were like, let's try to hold on for six months and then revisit our forecast, right? But, 
But putting something in place is critical because then you're all, you have common alignment and objectives, not something too heavy, something pretty light that everybody understands. Like for example, if you wanna know what other people are working on, here's where you look, because there is a lot of paranoia when you get bigger. Um, and, and those muscles, if you will, those company operating muscles will atrophy, like they will not develop if you don't start doing it at a certain stage, and then you can end up in real trouble. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example is, when I got to Stripe, there, were no, there was no job system, meaning most companies of a certain size have like, I hired you as an entry level support operations person. And if you're right out of college, by the way, you're mostly gonna come in, like literally you just graduated, as a level one. Uh, and there's a framework in the book about not tying, where it's just like, how much do you know? Have you ever done it before? No. You're gonna have to learn on the job. You're probably a level one. And the good news is you can get to level two pretty quickly in most companies. Getting to like level nine or 10 is gonna take a long time. But like each level has sort of requirements, the capabilities you need to have, the, the things you could do independently or not independently. Stripe had no such system, and in fact, was in a period of time, coming out of a period of time that I called the communist era, where they, the engineers themselves had decided to pay themselves all the same thing. Which is actually like a reasonable choice when you don't have a lot of time to focus, like decide what's our compensation, and you're mostly around all the same experience. A lot of the early engineers were in the friend group of John and Patrick, the co-founders. Uh, and they were all making, if I recall at the time, like $100,000 as early Stripe engineers. And then Stripe was like, oh, but we need to hire some more experienced engineers. And living in San Francisco, by the way, on $100,000 salary is pretty hard. And experienced engineers were like making a lot more than that at Google or Facebook. And they were like, well, no, excuse me, no. And so then this new head of engineering came in and he's like, mm, you know, I think we're gonna have to pay people more. But then he didn't tell everyone that he changed the communist policy. And it was a complete trust destruction moment for the company. So I came into this like really messy situation where everyone thought they were making the same. They just found out they're not for a good reason, which is let's hire more experienced people and like put some structures in place. But nobody told anybody disaster. And I was like, oh my God, I have to build a, not only a compensation structure system, a job leveling system for every function we have and roll it out. I called a bunch of companies, this is the story coming to a conclusion, and I called Airbnb, I talked to Square, I talked to one other company that, uh, the name is escaping me, and I was like, what happened when you rolled this out? And they were like, well, this thing that happened for us was we waited a long time to roll it out. I'm like, well, how long? Stripe, by the way, was like 250 people at this point. How long? And, they, and I think Airbnb was over 800 people when they put any kind of job structure in place. And the words that came back to me were bloodbath. Uh, mutiny, revolution, uh, distraction. <laughs> distraction was probably the lightest word I heard. And everyone's like, this will be terrible. Everyone will hate you, which was true. A lot of people at Stripe were very upset. Early employees being told they were a level two. They had just helped build the company to a really interesting point. Uh, were not happy. Uh, they were like, rip the Band-Aid off as fast as you effing can because you will end up in a revolution if you wait any longer. And we had a minor one. But these are the kinds of things that if you wait too long, you actually create a problem for yourself. This was an internal problem, but you can imagine the external version of this. What if you're selling a product, you don't understand your pricing, and you've priced it differently to all your customers? I have seen examples, not exactly of that, but similar to that. And what if the customers all of a sudden decide to share their, the pricing with each other? You have a customer conference, I've seen this happen, and people start comparing notes at the customer conference, they're chatting. And all of a sudden you have a customer revolution, which is like, why the hell am I paying monthly? And they're paying annually, and my fee is this, and your, their bundle is that. And so think about these things and how they magnify if you don't address them early on, if you don't create the rules of the game. That's literally all it is. But th what the rules are, does it matter as much as having them and learning how to have them and operate at speed and with excellence with them? And you don't need a lot. 
it's really interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, that was really helpful to hear the, the revolution story. Um, that's wild. I don't know what I would do. Let's not tweet about that, folks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, or or X or TikTok. No TikTok about Airbnb's revolution. Right. Um, so then that kind of leads us into, um, you know, you, you brought up operating principles um, when we were talking through that story. Yeah. And so this book uh, outlines four of your essential operating yes. principles. So I'd love if you could go through what those four are. Yeah. So. I think companies should have company values or operating principles at some stage. Again, not at the very beginning, but start looking for what they are because they generally emerge. They don't, you can't tops down them exactly. Uh, but I actually put out some, what I would call sort of leadership principles. Uh, the ones that I have found for myself work, but I think they could be adopted by others, but it's a way to think for yourselves about what would my leadership principles be. And so mine are um, build self-awareness to build mutual awareness. Um, a lot of the philosophy of the book is that management and leadership starts with you, not your team, which is a little counterintuitive. Like if you don't understand who you are and your implicit defaults and your bl like blind spots, by the way, are blind. So you don't really know what they are, but what do I know is what you're trying to figure out and what, I'm, what I, m might I compliment myself with so someone who's standing next to me can say, by the way, you're not noticing this thing over here, right? Because that is what happens. Um, so build self-awareness. Say the thing you think you cannot say. Um, being a direct and open and constructive communicator uh, is hard, especially when you get into management and leadership and people are very sensitive to what you say uh, and feedback you give, but if you stop giving it, uh, you will be failing at your job, uh, which I think people don't always realize until it's a little late. Uh, the third one is distinguish between management and leadership. Uh, which I'll just talk briefly about because I think it's a good one for your stage of... So in, in my simple mental model, people naturally default fault toward sort of leadership skills or management skills. Um, management, I'll start with, I'm more of a default manager. Very knowable. Like, okay, I've got to get from point A to point B. I've got to get a team together. What talent do I need? What are the objectives? What milestones? How might we measure our success? What does good look like? Like I can project manage almost anything. I've been doing, like even when I was a child, I would like organize people. Like it was like a natural thing that I enjoyed doing and, and came naturally. Leadership is a little harder to teach yourself. It is very uncomfortable. Being a leader is often being the only person in a certain role doing the thing. You often have a vision that you have to get other people to follow, which is hard because that you hear the words charisma, but it's really like, do you have a compelling vision? Are you able to share it in such a way that I would like climb a mountain and I don't even like climbing mountains, right? And by the way, you're gonna turn around at one point and be like, I've never climbed this mountain, but we're going, you know? Like, but leaders can do that. When you hear reality distortion of founders, this is what it is. Patrick will sometimes say, well, like have an idea in a meeting, Patrick Carlson, the Stripe co-founder and CEO, and they'll say, oh, we can code that up in like five minutes. And we'll all be nodding. And I'm like, what? We cannot code anything in five minutes. But we like literally are believing you because it sounds so easy and cool. And like, what a good idea. And now it's a joke between us, by the way. I'll say, oh, is that going to take five minutes? And he's like, definitely a five minute project. But anyway, point is leadership is this little bit, but it really makes people uncomfortable. Leadership is turning up the heat on people, but trying not to burn them. But, but it's very, and often, you're disappointing people, right? It's very different than management. Management is like, I have a plan. I'm going to hit these marks. I'm going to execute well. And leadership is like, we have no plan and we are going. You know? And so uh, my theory is this. You're default into one or the other, and you can go about your career fine until a point. And then you're going to hit a ceiling, in my opinion, if you don't learn the skills of the other. And I would argue I learned a little bit of leadership skill at Google. I was at Google for a long time. But actually, Stripe was where I sort of crossed into the leadership category. And I was like building management into the company, but it wasn't as much of what I did day to day, which was really uncomfortable for me. Uh, but I had to sort of be founder-like. And that was scary, honestly. But I think that helped me push through that ceiling in my career, sort of at Google, but really into Stripe. And so think about that. If you read the interview, my book has a lot of online content interviews. I interviewed Reed Hoffman. Reed's philosophy, by the way, is screw that, I'm a leader and I just hire people who do management. 
And that is the opinion of a lot of, we founded LinkedIn, if anyone, uh, and was early at PayPal and has had a very storied career. I don't subscribe to that because if you're the CEO, which Reed, by the way, stopped being pretty quickly, so that's a sign, of self-awareness, one hopes, I don't know the whole story, uh, but if you're gonna be the CEO, you have a team that you are the manager of. So you are leading a company, but you are the manager of a team. And a team, a good high-performing team needs a good manager. So I would say Patrick Collison is in management school <laughs> with me sometimes uh, because that is his aspiration. Uh, the final one is come back to your operating system. Uh, so for me, I think in the world today, all of you more than me, like you're just context switching so much between so many things, whether that's online, but like even in your work. And for me, the mo minute I was leading multiple teams with multiple functions and lots of complicated projects, having a common operating system of how those teams, not just the abstract layer of, okay, we all have a metrics that matter dashboard. We all have a mission, vision statement. We all have goals, quarterly goals. We all have this review protocol. Then I could drop in and out and it'd be like, all right, show me the dashboard. What's the goal? What's the goal scorecard? Where are we at on, you know, X project, right? And so it seems basic, but it's actually pretty important. And I think one of the things is I believe in your team leading you, like servant leadership, but there are some things that I need to impose on the teams as the leaders so that I can be effective. And getting that balance right is probably a lifelong skill. But, but don't forget sometimes to be a little bit selfish as a leader and say, I need this structure so I can function. Um, it's very interesting to me to watch founders who are more introverted versus extroverted. And the way that those founders make decisions, uh, if you all know, extroverts tend to talk to think and introverts tend to need to think to talk. And the founders really of both Stripe and Google, um, well, Larry Page and Patrick actually, differently than Sergey and John, are more introverted and not comfortable in a room with a group of people hashing out a decision and then having to make it right then. You are not gonna get a live synchronous decision out of them. They are gonna listen to you and they are gonna go and have a think. And the, more, the sooner you realize that and that they can articulate it, this is the self-awareness part, and say, I'm not gonna make a decision today I'd like you all to hash it out in front of me. I'd like to hear your arguments. I'd like to hear the data. I will come back by the end of the day with my decision. Does that make sense? Like, but a lot of people who are in roles of leadership thrash around trying to do what they think is expected of their decision-making approach when you have to build it to be appropriate for the way your brain works and what's comfortable for you and what you think the best decisions come from from you. But I think you, you are not allowed to hide and make no decisions, <laughs> uh, which can get to be problematic when we're not feeling super confident, which happens to a lot of founders because it's not like you've done it before, and that's where it's good to have people that you trust, that you can talk to, right? Like, you're not meant to do it alone. Uh, and, and remember that, too. So those are the operating principles, leadership principles. That's awesome. Yeah, you, it's really interesting um, that you talk about, you know, there are founders who are really successful who are introverted and founders who are really successful that are extroverted. And a theme of the book that I really loved was that anyone can do this thing, yes. but you have to know yourself. Yeah. It's that self-awareness piece. So I want to dig into that more because you, you mentioned that in the book that that's probably your most important, it's the most important one. principle. So, um, and it's interesting because it is inverted from other books that I've read that tend to focus on the team and not, yeah. not the individual. So can you explain why you focus on self-awareness like that. I, I really just don't think you're gonna get very far if you cannot figure yourself out. And, um, and that's just from my own personal experience as a, as a person and as a leader, but also observing so many different teams and organizations and companies and leaders in different moments of often of crisis. And um, here's another example. I mean, and, and basically I describe part of it, like I have so many work style assessments you all can take. Some of you have maybe taken some of these like Myers-Briggs or Gallup Strengths Finder, Enneagram or DISC, or there's one called Insights Discovery. Uh, there's the Big Five Personality Test. It's free online. You can take it. Uh, it has some uh, research behind it in terms of correlation to, to different success factors in your life. Um, 
for example, founders tend to be more disagreeable and I tend to be more agreeable, but anyway. Uh, but the, those aren't like the answer, but they're helpful to start to get some data on yourself. And this is where 360 feedback can be really helpful. But mostly we're all on a horizontal axis I already described, which is are you more introverted, sorry, extroverted or introverted? And it's a continuum. By the way, I am extroverted, but not as far over as people think I am. But, and in order to run a sales team, I had to dial up my extroversion. And by the end of the day, I would be exhausted because like I would be on, you know, with customers. And like that's like, be aware of that because your energy levels are kind of finite. They're just different levels of finite in this room. So I can't tell you what they are, but uh, so we talked about that. The other one is, are you more task oriented or more person oriented? And neither of those is wrong. There, there's no, like there's a little bit, sounds like I'm stereotyping and I want to avoid that. But the, the litmus test I tend to use is the following. If someone came up to you, someone you were working with on a project at school or your startup, and was like, oh my God, oh my God, human, humongous problem. And then they describe this super hairy like situation, right? And, you, and they're coming to you for help. And you just like, without even breathing, what your gut instinct is, do you first think of, here are the three things we need to do first? Or do you think, oh my God, those people are gonna freak out, Does it, right? Like that's it. It's like, where does your mind go on the, where this like problem solution will lie? And by the way, the answer is both. Like you have to be able to think about what you gotta get done and the people freaking out. But it's just what order do you kind of orient? And, um, and if you then, then I have these quadrants and I give sort of descriptions of the quadrants. But I think mapping yourself creates then an ability to see where your opposite might be. And what happens when we're surrounding our, when we're starting a company, when we're hiring the first employees, we tend to gravitate people toward who are like us. Uh, and I am actually talking about similarity in homogeneity and work style, actually, a little bit more than I'm talking about uh, diversity. But I actually believe that this is, uh, this is where gender, racial, socioeconomic, all kinds of diversity are going to eventually matter if you're going to build a high-performing team. However, there's a lot of good research. I mean, this is a side quest I'm going to take you on for a second, which is homogenous teams without any good management will be better. They will run faster because they have a common set of information by virtue of the fact that they have a common set of experiences and backgrounds and preferences. But diverse teams, if you invest in an inclusive environment, will be three to five X higher impact over time, but only if they're inclusively run. So does that make sense? So you're gonna need to have a fast moving homogenous team that does not come up with breakthrough stuff, or you're gonna have a early on a little slower moving, build the team, diverse team, that is eventually gonna have three to five X uh, and there's good research. Amy Edmondson, who did the psych safety book, has got some good studies that she's been a co-author of um, on, in things like the intensive care units of hospitals. But like intensive care units that have inclusively practiced nurses, anesthesiologists, doctors, have an 18% lower mortality rate. Like people are not dying because of that, right? So like I'm not luckily working in that field, but when you think about stuff like that, right? That was a side quest. But the point is you know your opposite. And one of the things that I learned in my career, especially when I was doing a lot of hiring at Google, and then I still made missteps at Stripe, but is the people that I really get along with in an interview is a good signal. Like, yay, that was enjoyable. I got energy from that. I love talking to you. Like, this was so, um, but it can be a very confusing and bad signal because actually some of my best hires in my career drove me a little bit crazy. Uh, in the interview, but especially if I started to negotiate with them about joining, um, I tend to need people who are more task data analytical, slower to decide, slower to act people around me. I'm very fast to decide and act. I'm very intuitive. Um, and I literally have a few people that it took me like two months to convince them to join Stripe and I wanted to kill them. And, and they were like, well, can you share more data? Or can you talk me through the investor? Or can I meet an investor? Can I meet a customer? And I was like, what is going on? Do you not trust me at all? Like, I was having like a relational reaction to that, right? I'm a little more people oriented. And they were like, no, they, it's data, lady. Give me the data, right? And I was like, oh my God. And then there was a point where they were just trying to de-risk it. And I, and I had to say to them, I'm like, you know what? It is risky. Like, don't join if you want me to de-risk it. But I'm thinking of like three or four people in my mind as I describe this to you, terrific hires, especially for me to work with because we could drive each other a little crazy toward a better outcome. 
which is they would sort of get, put the brakes on me when I needed them, and I learned to put the brakes on myself, and, and I would push them to action when they got stuck, right? Is that, because you get some analysis paralysis in certain quadrants, uh, which is not my problem, but I could benefit from a little more analysis sometimes, <laughs> which can be my problem. Uh, but learn that. Think about the team. Then you're building a better team. And you're building, and by the way, if you're an early stage company, which it sounds like some of the people here are, your early team members are the most important. Like, they are going to matter. They are building the company with you. And they will imprint on it. And I don't want anyone to get paralyzed by that. And you can move people out, and you should, if they're not working. And actually, my first meeting with, Stripe, with, with Patrick Collison was like a kind of brunch at this restaurant in Silicon Valley. It's a very Silicon Valley story, whatever. And he ended up asking me about a management problem, which is one of their early employees was causing a lot of issues. And they'd given him a lot of equity. And he was a good friend of them. And then he described how this person was behaving. And I said, well, it seems like you know what you have to do. And he was like, yeah. You know, like I got to tell my friend he's not working out at my company. And I gave him too much equity. Water under the bridge. Too bad, right? Rough. But talking to me helped him realize. Like I was like, I think, you know, there's nothing I have to tell you. You know the answer. But um, the point is, you will make mistakes. Don't worry. It's OK. But who those people are really matters. And how they compliment you really matters. That leads me perfectly into the next question, um, which is about the hiring process yes. and talent recruitment. So um, because a lot of us in the room are early stage founders, um, you know, how can we think about finding the right talent? And what should we be looking for in the first like five to 10 hires versus um, the strategy as you really start to grow beyond that? Yeah. Um, well, this is where context is, is obviously important, which is you, you probably haven't got product market fit. So you really need to build a product building team above all. Uh, so they have to have capabilities that matter for the business that you think or the product you're trying to build. Maybe you haven't figured out, by the way, what the business model is, but you know you've got to build this product and then you'll figure it out. So you're looking for folks who um, you have a high belief that they will add value in that product building phase. But the reality is that's a continuum of skills you need, right? Depending on the product. Some of them are technical skills, but some of them might be, um, someone once said, oh, I forget what the litmus test was, but it was basically people with a fairly like high amount of agency and problem solving and persistence capabilities. And they were like, what if you were traveling in a foreign country and got randomly arrested and you could only make one phone call? They were like, think of the person you know who you would call. <laughs> like that is usually someone, I mean, maybe in my stage of life, it is someone with a legal background or a lot of money or something. But honestly, you're like, who's the person who runs through walls to, to help? like to figure it out. And like some of Stripe's earliest hires who were the most impactful, by the way, were actually some of the least experienced. Stripe was unafraid to take risks. So some of our early employees were not yet 21. They had not graduated from schools and they were um, not even, like maybe they got out of high school, I don't know. Anyway, I can tell you stories about that. But some of these individuals, like there was no, there was nothing you could give them that they wouldn't figure out. Uh, and that's really powerful. It's rare, by the way. Really, like the, the version of it I'm thinking of is pretty rare. But they, they just were like unstoppable, but ideally pleasantly, right? Not unstoppable, high friction, Pyrrhic victory, everybody's dead version. But like the version of <laughs> we all got through the wall and you're out of jail, right? Um, and so I just think of it's that, that there's sort of a mindset. There's this generalist thing that I'm describing, which is I, these guys I'm thinking of, mostly guys, but there's a woman also in my mind, would also teach themselves anything they needed to know um, with like almost a boldness that you were like, whoa, really? You're going to call that person up who's an expert in the field? And then the person would talk to them. And you're like, oh, OK, because you just are so convincing. right? So you need that range of skill, technical skill, the capabilities to build the product, and the sort of generalist, unstoppable solvers. Um, and what happens at companies, by the way, is early on, you're going to have more generalists who are earlier career who are good at teaching themselves and taking risks. And then as you scale, you have to specialize more. And that's tricky for people, because the generalists start to get sad. 
but don't worry about that now. Get, get the best. And then take my advice on, you probably have people in your network that are going to be very valuable to you, um, but they may lack diversity of what work style of all types. So think about how you overcome that. And yes, people yeah. should run off if you have to go to class or whatever <laughs> is happening. What time are we at, by the way? We're at five, so ten. Oh. Okay. I have one more question, then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Yeah. Um, but I thought this one was really important. You talked a lot about uh, throughout the book about creating a good culture in a company. Yeah. Uh, and so I wanted to pull out two different lines that I'd like you to talk about. So the first one is creating psychological safety. Yeah. Um, and then the second one, you have a quote from the former CEO of Hallmark that says, uh, in a business environment, you have to be brutally honest. But to be br brutally honest, you can't have a culture that's brutal. Um, so can you talk both about the psychological safety and informal feedback? Um, They're basically related, like mm -hmm. those two, absolutely. Um, so psycho Amy, who I've met now, um, and she and I actually did a webinar together for The Economist randomly. But uh, she kind of regrets coining the term psychological safety because it's like used in this blanket way doesn't really have a lot of meaning anymore, and that's too bad. So I kind of say inclusive practices. But I guess I would say to you that, I mean, <laughs> so first of all, like this is the stuff that's easy to say, it's hard to do. One, when you're leading a team, it's important to care about the people. But you can't like make that up. So like there's a little bit of like, well, what, what's your version of caring? And you've got to find it. Because they will feel it if you care or not. Uh, there's also, you can talk a lot about trust. Like teams that have high trust are teams that perform, like no doubt. Well, how do you build trust? You offer trust, right? Are you a trusting person? How does someone earn your trust? Really think about that because what this has to become is tactics. And the thing that's weird about like psych safety or inclusiveness is it's very tactical. Um, it's extreme, it's for example, you have a bunch of introverts on your team, they don't like to show up to a meeting with no agenda. They mm -hmm. want to know what they're supposed to think about ahead of time. They want the pre-read. Some people don't care. I don't care. You can put me in a room with someone I trust and you and I could start the agenda, figure it out right now and then talk. I'm fine. But I've now worked with people who are like, that's their worst nightmare. They're like, I have no time to prepare my thoughts. Like, are you kidding me? But like, so the tactic is I'm going to send the stuff ahead of time, even though I don't need it. Other people need it to be their best. Or I want everyone in the room to participate. I'm going to run a meeting where I track who's participating, and I figure out a way without making someone uncomfortable to say, hey, Janelle, we haven't heard a lot from you today. I'd love your thoughts. And, and they're like, oh, I'm being included. Like, my, my voice matters. Right? Does that, like, these are very tactical things. How you sit in the room, how you present yourself um, in, in, when making a decision. How you say, like, I'm going to make a decision, like, you can say this autocratically, I'm just going to decide. But usually what I say is I want all of your opinions, but I'm ultimately going to make the decision. Or I'm going to delegate the decision. But, like, really building trust with saying some things in your head out loud and doing some tactical stuff um, to build trust in the environment in which you will operate, which will go a long way when you're under pressure and when you're in crisis. And you have to say to someone, I can't explain it, but I need you to go do this thing right now. And someone's like, well, they usually explain it to me. So, okay. Right? That's what you're trying to build. Uh, and, and Don Hall's quote, I loved that quote, which is too many people, I don't know, they read Principles by Ray Dalio. I don't know. They, they believe they can create this open and direct culture that gets very easily a little bit brutal. Um, and, and I would say... Yes, you want an open and direct culture, but you want it with care, right? Like, it's not helpful in front of a room of 20 people and someone just presented their idea to say, well, that was a terrible idea. Thanks, Dan. Right? And, and I think, like, no. You're going to ask a question you're, that hopefully elicits some more information from Dan that makes it a less sort of tricky idea in your mind, but you're going to talk to them privately about, you know, that was interesting that you took all our time in the meeting to share this thing. But whatever. <laughs> like, you're not going to do, like, you just don't do the brutal thing because you actually want a culture where the next time Dan will share his idea. Right. Or should Dan leave in this example? But that's a decision that should be made outside of a room of people. 
And I think too much, and also with the pandemic, weirdly, we've lost some of our humanity. But the thing that you lose is not, I'm not going to say the thing. That's why you have to say the thing you think you can't say. It's how am I going to say the thing? How am I going to do it with care? And people appreciate it. One of my favorite expressions when I'm giving feedback is I own it. And I'll just say to someone, I'm worried that you are struggling. I'm worried. What do you feel? Are you struggling? Like, am I... And maybe I'm reading this wrong. And, they'll, and some people will say, well, what do you mean? And I'll say, well, I saw this thing happen and this thing. And they'll be able to explain it, and maybe I was wrong. And sometimes they'll say, oh, my God, I am struggling. <laughs> and then they start crying. But if I hadn't said that, if I hadn't said, I'm worried, I see you struggling, but I'm owning it, then we never would have had the conversation where I could then help them, ideally. All right. Yeah, like okay. I'll, 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 I'm sorry. I'm always an over talker. It's a it's a lifelong problem. <laughs> That's why the book is so long. <laughs> and any speed questions or anything? All right, we have right. Okay, we'll do these two and then we'll wrap up. I was going to just ask what's your MBTI. Oh, you know, the first time I took it when I was in my twenties, it was ENFP, but it was really only strong N was my only strong, and now it's ENTJ, but it depends. It depends on when you ask me. But I'm always a little more E and N. N, intuition. All right, over here. I thought mine is E or INFP. INFP, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to ask was, in terms of you know figuring out how you work and what your work style is, um, would you say that when you're approaching like recruiting people for a startup, that it's best to just like lay that out first and then figure out um, you know how they work as well as like a main way of figuring out whether it would be a good partnership or what would you say something more like hands on or working through the task together? Yeah, this is a I get this a version of this question a lot. I think some startups are able to pull off having some people come in and help do work without like whether that's an internship or a summer project or a hey let's do a trial. Like some of them could figure that, that would be ideal. Like being in the environment with a person, but it's not always an ideal world where they're like, I need a job. Like, are you hiring me or not? And, and in that case, I think you're also asking, how much do you lay out this is how we do things versus evolve it based on the talent you have? That's a beautiful question. And the answer is you kind of have to do both, which is set some framework for, hey, we all on Monday mornings give status reports. Like that's a reasonable thing to ask for if you've got a couple people working on something. But what you might discover over time is how people want to give their status. Maybe you don't get too prescriptive and you see what happens and then you start to, because the thing that YC often, Y Combinator says is like do the unscalable thing. That's true in management practices too, which is let's do a thing for a few weeks, a few months, and it's not like exactly figured out and then inductively figure out, oh, this actually way of giving each other status seems to be the one that works the best for all of us. And so it's getting that balance right between a principle, which is we probably should update each other on our work, and then a practice, which is exactly how we do that, is something we should come to together that will then, again, be inclusive. But as the leader, you eventually want to pin it. You want to say, okay, by six months from now, we're going to know our format for this. And even better, we'll know our tool that we're going to use so we can do it more efficiently, right? So it's really principle, practice, and then tools. Uh, is that? Yes, great questions. Thank you all for your attention, and thank you to the Nelson Center for hosting me. Uh, and for Dana, and to Dana for being such a great model.